Hello everyone. Um, my name is Yuella Jackson and I'm a young creative and presenter based in Bristol um, and the engagement producer of Social Enterprise Rising Arts Agency, Agency and welcome to today's session. You're in for a little bit of a treat today because we've got um, the awe-inspiring Jonathan Porritt who we're going to be doing an in conversation with and I will introduce in just a moment. We are going to be getting into it, taking the lead from his new book, Hope in Hell, um, exploring what we need to be doing in the next 10 years to confront the climate emergency. So to kick us off, we're going to open with a brief provocation from Jonathan in just a moment before we dive into the conversation. But just to let you know that we will be doing a 15 minute Q&A at the end. So please drop your questions into the chat and we will try to get those answered. So. For those of you who are not familiar, Jonathan's had a very impressive career. Jonathan has been on the front line for green campaigning for more than 45 years. He's been a member of the Green Party throughout that time and has worked tirelessly to promote the solutions to today's convergent environmental crises. As a director of Friends of the Earth in the 80s, co-founder of the Forum of the Future, the UK's leading sustainable development charity, chair of the UK Sustainable Development Commission, president of Population Matters and Conservation Volunteers. And on top of that, Jonathan is the chancellor of Keele University. His work as author and broadcaster has had a huge impact over the past few years. And we're so excited to welcome him back to communicate. So Jonathan, hello. Hi there, Yuella. Sorry I was doing? a little bit late uh, getting on screen, but there we go. <laughs> no, it's all good. This is what, yeah, technology is actually probably <laughs> usually more problems than, than helpful at the moment. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, we um, thank, you for, thank you for joining us. And um, it would be great if you wanted to share your provocations with us. Sure. No, well, thank you. And, and delighted to be back with uh, Communicate. It's an organization that, that I know well. And um, it's a huge, been such an inspiration to so many people over so many years. So it's nice to be able to join today and to share this space with you too, Yuella, because as you probably know from Hope in Hell, I spend quite a lot of time now uh, working with and uh, trying to help inspire young people to do what they feel they need to do now to address the climate emergency. Because I think what really got me into writing Hope in Hell was the realization there were an awful lot of older people there who simply had no perception of how young people are feeling about this. They had no sense of what I've called the intergenerational cry of rage coming from young people. They'd sort of got used to the fact that climate change was done in the margins of politics, bit by bit, tiny little incremental steps, if we were lucky, and that nobody but nobody in politics really saw it as an outright climate emergency, despite the fact that lots of people are signed up to a climate emergency. But the weird thing is, you can sign a climate emergency as easy as you like, but then you don't have to do anything about it. So that is really weird. It's a bit like Greta Thunberg reminding people that if you ring the fire brigade because your house is on fire, you do want them to come quite quickly rather than wait for another 10 years or so. So that's what got me into this. It's what makes me quite a bit of the time quite angry about the inability of um, establishment politicians and um, advisors and media people and so on to understand that now we have ascertained that it is an out and out genuine emergency, we've got to respond accordingly. The hope end of that, of course, as we've talked about, Yuella, is that I'm definitely in the camp of those who say that this is not too late. We've got the time that we need to do what we have to do. We really have still. But that makes this decade fundamentally important because it's really what we have to do by 2030 that matters, despite the fact that the politicians love all those 2050 targets because most of them know they won't be around by then, of course. So that's easy. Um, that is that is brilliant. I think young people are definitely something that we've got in common. Um, that you know the kind of what you call the kind of intergenerational cry of rage mm. is is something that's so so relevant and and something that's comp like ongoing. I think um, it, it's been interesting to see what is what that rage has kind of turned into over the past 
past few years and you, you've mentioned Greta what what do you think is kind of different now with in terms of young people and and that kind of action in relation to rage I think a lot of it is just that the impacts of climate change are in our lives all the time we get to see what's going on in distant parts of the world or close at home because we have our own climate impacts that are pretty grim for people to deal with uh, not least the very serious flooding that we've had on many occasions over the last few years but we see it all the time we see what's going on in terms of wildfires in australia or or america whatever it might be we see the effects of flooding we see crazy things like the arctic suddenly having temperatures in the upper 30s 30 degrees centigrade in the Arctic. So young people today see all that. They get they get the fact that climate change isn't something for tomorrow. <laughs> the climate is changing right now. So it's so immediate. It's so much in our faces. And I think that that has heightened the sense of urgency for young people. And, and we've talked a bit about the contrast between the end of 2019, when the emergence of Extinction Rebellion and school strikes changed the dynamics of the climate movement completely. And then, of course, knocked sideways by COVID-19, where so much of that energy has necessarily been put on the back burner. Let's be honest, we just haven't been yeah. able to um, sustain the same kind of momentum as we saw in 2019. Mm, I think it's, re it's really interesting because I remember, like when I was reading your book, it kind of reminded me of, I guess, my... Um, I, you know, my I've never really felt a sense of ownership for, you know, for the longest time over the kind of the, right over the climate emergency. It always felt like even when I was learning about it at school, it was like, wow, this seems like a real big issue. Like, why is no one doing anything about it? And and the, the teachers would kind of say, well, you know, that's for the scientists <laughs> to kind of, you know, the scientists yeah. and, and the politicians. And it was like, OK, well, they're real. They're really smart. I'm sure they. They know what they're no, doing, and I'm it sure it'll get so <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was like another thing where it's like, let let the adults deal with it. You know, you just worry about you know your GCSEs and stuff like that. Um, but it was something that we never really took as something as like a you know, for, it was seen as a little bit of a conspiracy theory or yeah. almost, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, whether it was maybe because we were just so like gullible, we were like, "This is a thing." Like that sounds really serious, you know. But I think you, um, I think you ought to put a lot of that down to the uncertainty of many teachers because they just haven't, they haven't known how to reflect this. They don't, they hear a lot about it and they know that they've got a responsibility with the young people they're teaching, but they don't quite know how to do that. And a lot of that plays out in terms of those rather stilted conversations that you were having with your teachers. I hear that story so often. That it's not that they are indifferent. They just don't know how to play it. Yeah, and it, it's quite a weird line, and we'll probably get into that in a minute about, you know, the, the kind of the treading the, the line between it's too late and exactly it, like we've still got time, you know, <laughs> and how you communicate that to, to others and how you, you know, don't disagree but I wanted to talk a little bit about about your book and and kind of what the process was like writing this book because it's very current you know it feels almost as if you wrote it yesterday <laughs> you know what was that process like for you uh, it was actually it wasn't an easy process it was quite painful um, I could write it quite fast that wasn't the problem but actually just digging right down deep into what is happening to the climate and the speed with which it's changing and the implications of that for all of us today so we've got i've, I've got two daughters they're 32 and 29 and i kept thinking all the time okay if you think about 2050 that's just a neutral date if you think about how old the people you love are going to be in 2050, it's a different story. If you think about the fact the scientists tell us that we're going to have a minimum of a one meter sea level rise by the end of the century, that sounds like a neutral fact. But then you think, okay, what does a one meter sea level rise mean for all the people we actually love, the people we love and the people we know will be suffering so directly because of that. And so once you dig into that and you begin to think about it from that perspective it it's hard because it it bears on every single part of our lives um emotional as well as political and for people like me it just ramps up this 
responsibility story on the basis that we haven't so far done a terribly good job so it was quite a it was actually quite difficult and as you said what is the difference between too late for some things but not too late to do the critical things that's a difficult balancing act yeah and i think you did it i think you did it really well i must say um you know there's there's a lot of great stuff in your book i think you know my favorite chapter or section is you know reasons to be cheerful because i was really expecting the doom and gloom i kind of sucked myself up for doom and gloom and it wasn't it wasn't like that that wasn't really the story um <laughs> as much as what, as what i thought it was going to be um which which then gave me gave me that that kind of that hope that that you that you spoke about um and i wanted to look at or even touch on the the role of storytelling yeah. in 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 this because you know you've you've written a book and i know that there's lots of people here who are thinking about how we best communicate things that are not like you know that there was a question in the in the chat about that kind of paralysis where people feel like powerless which i felt like most of my life and how we kind of move on to that action so do you think that there's things that you know the creative industries the people people in marketing what we can be doing better or what we can be prioritizing in terms of storytelling over the next nine years yeah no i'm that is such an important part of it because i have come across a lot of people who are completely disempowered by the truth about climate change you know the scientific reality if you just stick it in front of someone and say look this is the way things are going on so don't disagree with it because that's the truth and then you kind of walk off and leave them with that well of course we feel disempowered and wonder what the hell we can do about all of that and actually i've seen sometimes speakers and scientists just dump people with this these facts and sort of move on but we can't do that we have to have i think a a new set of narratives to tell there's not any one narrative for this but i think some of the narratives need to come from the stories of people who are fighting back to stop this. So the stories of the climate champions who are out there, and boy, are they some amazing stories. I mean, just extraordinary what is going on in so many parts of the world, people who simply are not lying down and just letting this thing roll over them. And then there's another host of wonderful narrative possibilities, which is about how much better our world could be. So we've got to be able to tell the upside the narratives about the upside as well as the narratives about the champions and the activists who are doing their amazing things but both of those the combination of those two things wow that is really positive that is positive i i you know i i'm really kind of seduced by this idea of what the world could be um and i was really um excited and i kind of did this massive kind of like like a sigh of relief when when I saw it in your book that you you meant like you spoke about um climate justice and social justice being two sides of the same coin um that's something that I've always found particularly frustrating just because of I know how it feels to feel like you're not part of that yeah. or you you have no authority to speak on it um and I've kind of been going over this like this this journey of of really trying to reclaim the world that we live in, you know, and feel like it's something that I um, can neither shape but also enjoy at the same time. So how can we start to kind of empower people to feel this way, to, to see to see things in that way that, yeah. that there could be a new way, a new life? Well, we could start with all the conventional environmental organisations who still find it difficult to understand that climate justice and social justice are two sides of the same coin. Sorry, I don't want to get too critical, but there are a ton of environmentalists in this country who still do not see these two things as inextricably connected. But I tell you what has really cheered me up lately, Uella, is um, I have been reading the Joe Biden, Kamala Harris climate plan, which was part of their, obviously their election campaign. And it's, Honestly, it's amazing. I mean, it is absolutely amazing. And I've discovered now, of course, which I didn't know before, that Kamala Harris has been a champion of environmental justice 
for a long time, 15 years ago, she set up an environmental justice office when she was um, district attorney in California. So she's got climate justice, environment justice, sitting alongside her own passion about social and racial justice, which makes that document unlike any other document I've ever read from an American politician. Well, actually, any other climate document I've read from almost any other politician anywhere. So I'm loving that because that is putting those two things really, really tightly together and saying that the measures they're going to introduce, they've set aside 40% of the recovery package will be directed at those communities that have been particularly badly affected by environmental injustice up until now. And of course, many of those are communities of color. They are communities which have mm. had all the worst aspects of US big business dumped on them decade after decade after decade. Yeah. And that now needs a huge amount of putting right, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing to see that how how progressive they're. It's incredible. They're, it, it kind of, <laughs> <laughs> and, and to think that that might not have been the case. Well, yeah, um, I've, yeah that was a bit upsetting for a while, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we came through that one, thank heavens. So it's those things that really, I think, give us hope. I think on the narratives of telling what the world can look like, um, there are a few things going on out there. And I actually, I think, Yuela, your, your organization, the Rising Arts Agency, is a bit involved in telling these stories and giving people a chance to tell the stories. The one thing I'd recommend to people if they haven't come across it, which is a beautiful little whiteboard animation which is vo voiceover from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, in the USA. It's just a voice, it's called A Voice from the Future. Um, and if you, no, it's not, it's called A Message from the Future, sorry. A Message from the Future. And it, it's, if you just Google that or whatever search engine you want to use, um, and it's on YouTube and it's just seven minutes worth. And it just says, look, this is the way the world could be. Why would you not want to live in this world in comparison to the wretched world that so many of us have to live in today. So those things, things like that, beautiful exercise of communication skills at their best, um, very inspiring for people. And it's interesting because it's not like um, capitalism doesn't do that, like in terms of its kind of seductive m marketing techniques, you know, the whole, the whole premise of the way in which capitalism works is to kind yeah. of give people this... <laughs> this is what your life could look like. So it's just about kind of altering or, or using those those same techniques to, to really um, empower people to, to believe that things can be different. Does that include the dark arts of advertising and marketing you, Ella? Because then you see, <laughs> that, no, it's really, it's a really interesting question because whenever we think of communications for the stuff that we're really passionate about, we don't mm. think about some of those other communication skills because we know that for the most yeah. part they're deployed for lots of things that we're not so passionate about if I'm yeah polite for a moment but I was really interested because there was a big initiative launched by the Adver marketing association that's right just last week saying we are now going to work with all of our members to see what they can do to bring net zero stories to life for their clients and I thought mm. oh, okay well, there's a bit of a twist. We'll have a bit of yeah. where that takes us, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we do need to, um, you know, I do think it's, it's, we need to be very resourceful um, in, in, exactly. what we, in what we're trying to do. And I think, you know, if they've got, if they've got some of the tools. Um, and they have, we, and they've got, they've got <laughs> clients who've got a lot of the money. So we need to put yeah. the tools together with the money to make some of this stuff really work for people in a different way. And it's often more surprising if it comes from that source than if it comes from a, an NGO or a, you know, another campaign yeah. organization or whatever it might be. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so true because, you know, um, at the moment, especially with, um, the kind of resurgence of the black lives matter movement, Ben and Jerry's have been going in with their marketing and, um, you know, I've never, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a haagen girl, but I was all over Ben and Jerry's. I was like, they can take all my money, you know? So I think there is, there is definitely, um, very, definitely space for that, um, in the climate justice yeah. movement. Yeah, no, I think there is, um, yeah. 
we were um, talking a little bit about Biden and, and Harris and I, I, you know, with, with Rising, we're thinking a lot about radical leadership. And I was wondering if you had any kind of um, any thoughts on what type of leaders we need or who should we be looking to? We spoke about young people, like who, who are the sorts of leaders we should be looking at now when we're trying to do things a little bit differently? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I'm very struck that there's no one model of leadership with this stuff because it's it, it's just a way of combining so many different talents and so many different sources of energy in the same place. And some of this can happen at the local government level. You know, you do have the privilege, you had of living in Bristol as a city. It's not bad. It is seriously trying. I think what somebody said in the chat box a minute ago, there are very few places that have declared a climate emergency that are actually genuinely now trying to do something about it. So celebrate that while we can. There's so much energy amongst young people to bring this stuff forward. I've just said, don't disregard the energy from the private sector because sometimes that energy can be really critical. The leadership behind all of that is one that is based though on complete integrity because you do need people to be with you in the entirety of themselves and to be making this stuff work um, personally as well as kind of professionally or for any political reasons, whatever it might be. And I've come to appreciate that more and more, that the real standout leadership quality that I guess resonates more with me now than almost anything else is that complete personal integrity and authenticity. And it's everything else becomes possible if you've got that. It's very hard to, yeah. to make this stuff work without that. Brilliant. Thank you. I um I was kind of thinking about um just yeah just the kind of journey that I've been on through reading your book. I know that I keep going on about it, but it's it's my first. Okay, thank you. It's my first. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's my first um to what you know book addressing climate mm. emergency because I've never really been able to like bring myself to do it um, because I'm like I want to escape. Uh, why would I want to, you know, <laughs> when I read, I want to escape. I don't want to be, you know, depressed or, or whatever or, or feel compelled to do things. But um, it's, it's been it's been really it's been really amazing. Um, so I guess I just wanted to ask you about um, kind of the, the way in which, you know, you speak of civil disability disobedience in, in your book as a, a kind of thing that we should be looking to so one could you explain a little bit what you mean by that and then two um you know why why do you think that civil civil disobedience is something that we should be looking to in the future yeah i mean that was the other thing that made the book slightly harder to to write than otherwise because it reminded me that my, the first half of my career in the green movement was in friends of the earth and the green party and of course that more radical end of the green movement has always been accepting of the importance of non-violent direct action of civil disobedience as one of the whole range of tactics that environmentalists have used over many many decades and, and i'm very comfortable with that i mean i i'm i'm a member of the green party and the green party has Nonviolent direct action actually written into its constitution as an important part of what we do, at least our founding philosophical principles, sorry, not our constitution. But So I, I feel that's a really important part of the politics of this. But the simple conclusion I came to was that if you look at where the science tells us we are, and that's the bit that you can't turn away from, however uncomfortable it is, and then you look at the political response to that, there's just a vast gap. That's the sort of gap story. And you can either hope that carrying on doing climate politics in the way we've done it for the last 20 years will fill that gap, narrow the gap, or like me, you can say, no, it won't. It won't, because these politicians, they've got used to that kind of gentle, incremental, slow process of change, and they're used to it. And that's why they shove everything out till 2050, because then they don't have to worry about it. So into that gap for me, comes a lot more civil disobedience, a lot more people prepared to take action to demonstrate the need for urgent change, not just for change, but urgent change and equitable change, change that is just and compassionate as well as just 
changing the economy at the margins. I don't think we can narrow the gap without that level of civil disobedience. And I look at other movements in history to sort of highlight why I think that's the case, including the abolition of slavery and um, universal suffrage and women's rights and all those. I, you know, I look at those movements. It took an awful lot of people, very brave, courageous people over many, many decades to get politicians eventually to do what they needed to do. It's, I, you know, I've always been a bit honest. That's like my jam. <laughs> I, I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking about, um, you know, the fact that, you, you know, this came out at the kind of beginning of the pandemic when things really weren't business as usual. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you think that that's created scope for us now? We can kind of see how there's new ways of living and doing, or do you think that that's kind of pushed us back in terms of um, our agenda? Yeah, I'm still a bit, um, what am I? I'm a bit confused on that one, Yuella. It certainly knocked us back in terms of the forward momentum, the campaigning momentum, there's no doubt about that. But good things did happen as a consequence of that social trauma, really. Um, people did have opportunities to think differently about some things, about their part in the community. There was such a upsurge in community support, readiness just to chip in and make stuff happen, particularly for more vulnerable people in the community. That solidarity was extraordinary to begin with. A sense that some people had they could reconnect more with the natural world than had been the case in the past. And that in a way is such an important thing to communicate is how do you actually deepen that sense of connectivity between people in the environment. I've noticed there's a lot less about that now we're in the winter than there was when we were in the spring. So that just means we were all just fair weather reconnectors rather than sort of deep winter reconnectors, but don't give up on it. It's still beautiful in the winter. So just stick with that side of it. So there have been some, there have been some really important things, but, but in a way we're struggling. Well, I think to be fair, we are still struggling to see whether we've learned the lessons of COVID in terms of addressing the climate emergency and latest government declarations from Boris Johnson or Rishi Sunak tells me that they certainly haven't learnt enough from COVID-19 pandemic to address the climate emergency. They, they're on rung one of a pretty steep ladder ahead of them. Definitely, um, it definitely reflects that goes back to your your point about integrity and authenticity mm. and in leadership and um yeah i think that's that's been very very interesting um we we have a, a, a quote from your book that is that says hope is something that you we do rather than we than something that we have um what do you see um hopeful action looking like today now that a bit weird and we are in the winter um yeah yeah i um I, I think none of that energy from 2019 has gone away it's just kind of just got parked for a bit as it were it's all there still and extinction rebellion have been doing some fantastic stuff uh this year and young people's organizations have been doing fantastic stuff but it's just harder um I really admire what XR has been doing, and they've just launched a new campaign about civil disobedience around money and around how we need to think about ways in which we can use our money, whatever it might be, more effectively to take action against yeah. those that are causing the problem. So I don't think that stuff has, has disappeared at all. Um, for me, what I'm hoping, of course, is that 2021, we, we can very quickly begin to reconnect with that form of direct action. Um, COP26 at the end of the year, it's just going to be a, another great sort of word fest unless we're careful. I just want to shout out for Mock COP going on at the moment. I don't know whether you've linked into Mock COP at all, Uella, but this is a, an initiative running right now organized by SOS UK, which is the um, biggest students organization promoting sustainability in the UK, brilliant organization. And they've been doing this Mock COP, so COP Conference of the Parties, They've been doing this involving delegates from, I think it's 140 countries or 136 countries 
all around the world, basically saying, if COP was happening and young people were running it, this is what we would be doing in the world today. And I've been keying into a few of those sessions. It's still running now, by the way, if anyone just wants to um, find mock COP, it's very inspiring. That's, you know, that's action. That's going right to the heart of what we still need to be doing. Um, I'm definitely going to check that out. I love young people just doing stuff. Yeah, no, it's great. It's very, it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you think that there's, do you know, do you think that there's space for the kind of small action still in, in this, in this, the 10 yeah. years? I do, yeah? I do. I, I, I've always felt that you can't, you can't, turn away from the importance of personal responsibility and just hope that other bigger things are going to get it sorted out. We still have to do what we can in our lives, those smaller actions, as you describe them. And my God, you are, people are doing this. You know, I was just reading a report the other day that meat consumption in 2019 fell significantly around the world. And part of the reason for that was so many more people were choosing plant-based diets. And yeah. Part of that was that more and more young people are choosing plant-based diets and not consuming meat in the same amount that uh, people used to. So these personal things can aggregate up to make for a big change. My caution about putting too much weight on personal responsibility is on its own, it's never enough. We have to have the political change as well. So for me, that I, I, I quite like what Al Gore former Vice President Al Gore used to say, he had, a very, he had a very simple way of capturing what it is that we have to do. He called it choice, voice, and vote. So choice, the choices we make matter. Voice, wherever you are, you have to raise your voice and bring people into a shared space of action um, of the sort we've been talking about, and then vote, because ultimately that it is in the end going to be a whole set of political decisions which will make this change amazing i've just been looking into the chat um there seems to be quite a few questions so it, we're going to jump into some of the questions now Very good. But, but please do pop more in if you've got any for jonathan we you know this festival and um we can we can all give give jonathan our, our last thoughts but um, there's a question here saying, do you think that there is a disconnect between people and nature slash the environment? We keep hearing about the climate emergency, but a lot of people still have different priorities and the word emergency seems to have been lost. Is it because people need more guidance slash empowerment? I think the first thing is when we can make the climate and ecological emergencies come together. I mean, there's a bill which has been introduced in Parliament now by Caroline Lucas, and it's, it's called the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. So it's connecting the two things. And that is partly because we can't ignore the biodiversity crisis going on around us. And part of that does track back to the sense of disconnect between people and the natural world. And that's important. And the Natural History Consortium has been working away at that story about connection year after year after year trying to bring that into people's lives very directly for me that's pretty important um i'm i'm hugely supportive of this thing called the the, the national nature service the idea that the government really now should be getting behind nature oriented recovery packages creating new jobs by essentially healing the damage we've done to the natural world and all the big NGOs have been pitching in on that, coming up with really brilliant creative ideas for creating jobs, and they would be predominantly jobs for uh, young people, to help the economy, sure, but help the economy by helping nature. And that's very direct connectivity. As, as you mentioned, I'm president of the Conservation Volunteers, and that's what we do, and we're very very proud of the work that we do there but i'd like to see that scaled up so that it involves tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of young people if possible i think that it is it's interesting this um you know how you how people and bring people in when people are so different you know like their immediate lives feel so 
um, so different. And um, I definitely agree about bringing, making, you know, having that connection. How can you make people connect with what the issues are and see it through their, their everyday life? So yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you for asking that question. Um, we have another question about, do you think civil disobedience can lose public support on the issue, e.g. backlash, backlash for the protests at the Cenotaph? Taff. It can. Yeah, and there is always that risk, and it puts a huge burden of responsibility on organizations to get that right. Um, it's a difficult judgment call that you have to make all the time, but doing it in ways that are sensitive to other people that don't agree with the pressing urgency of the case that we're making, um, doing it in ways that don't sort of almost deliberately seek to cause offense. Um, I think most of what most of the direct action we've had over the last couple of years has been really solid, really responsibly planned and managed. And look, let's be honest, you know, there are always going to be some people who are not going to like other people breaking the law to make their case. Well, I'm sorry, too bad. At, at a certain point, I just want to say too bad. It means you haven't really understood the mm. nature of the challenge that we face. That's That's the truth of it. So dig in a bit deeper yourself and see why so many people are so courageously making these commitments, making this contribution to a better world. Try and understand their perspective before you just do your default knee-jerk criticism. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree with that. I was about to mention the Daily Mail, but then I thought, no, don't do that, Jonathan. <laughs> Not worth it, but you know what I mean. There is a sort of part of the body politic in the UK which we will never get on board. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, as, as part of the, the kind of marketing, anticipating that and, and being being prepared, if you know that it's probably always going to happen in some way, um, just kind of exactly. Exactly. that. Yeah. But don't yeah. give them hostages to fortune. That's the thing. Just so many ways of doing direct action really creatively and smartly. Yeah. So we've got another question here. So Jonathan, do you think most conservation organizations are tinkering around the fringes and not really facing up to the crisis? <laughs> well, gosh, that's a tough one for me. Um, I, I feel there's been an underselling of the urgency, to be honest. I think a lot of organizations have been very nervous about what we, we were just talking about earlier, Uella, which is if you, if you whack them over the head with too much doom or gloom, they're just not going to go with you. They're not going to support you. They're just going to kind of give up on it in a disempowered heap. And, and I think a lot of organizations have felt constrained by that. And maybe they've been ultra cautious because as charities, they don't want to be seen to be exaggerating or making more of the science than exists. But honestly, now with, with the scientists telling us what they're telling us, there's no conceivable reason for any mainstream environmental organization in this country not to be pressing their own emergency button day in day out including the way they engage with politicians and i don't want to get too controversial to quite near the end but let's face it there are too many environmental ngos who still sycophantically want to suck up to this government as they've often wanted to suck up to governments before and what is happening in the name of this government's recovery package, Build Back Better, or as I call it, Build Back Bollocks, is really unacceptable. So NGOs, in my opinion, should demonstrate their knowledge of this situation by saying what the government is doing today is completely and utterly unsatisfactory, in, inadequate in every respect. But their criticism has been so polite and tame and muted, and you just think, oh, God. Get out there and say it as it is, please. I think um, with a lot of these, um, with a lot of these um, conservation organisations, there might also be a kind of fear of how you keep sustained with with the urgency or the emergency. It's like if you're saying, um, you know, we're, we've got an emergency, and you're you've been saying that for fifteen years. <laughs> You know, people are going to be like, well, it was an emergency five years ago. I'm going to I've stopped donating or, do, do, you know, what, what, know what, you kept you sustain, what has kept you sustained in your in your kind of career and how in your work? Yeah, quite a lot of 
anger along the way it has to be said as you can probably tell <laughs> so you've got to be you've got to be a bit obstinate you've got to be a, a you know ready to dig in and accept that things won't necessarily happen the way that you want them to happen or you think they can happen but reverting to one thing we said before um you had a my my connection with the natural world is what has kept a, my a lot of my campaigning activity on track i mean i for me that's that's real that actually matters a lot and i think when you can connect into that that sort of understanding of of the importance of the natural world it helps it's not true for everybody but for me i've got that side of it and i've got the social justice bit of it because that's where my politics has been since 1974 and and if the eco bit isn't working then the social justice bit usually works um so it's uh you there's just what, what would you do? What's the point of giving up at this stage when suddenly a lot of things are beginning to change? They really are beginning to change yeah. now. Yeah, it's, it is great. And, but we do have a lot to be hopeful for. And we've got a couple of minutes left. So I would really appreciate it if in the chat people can just kind of pop things that have kept them sustained or made them hopeful or future because we leave on a bad note um there's a question <laughs> you know there's enough of that in the world um there's a question here about policy and influencing policy how can we influence this before it is changed and we don't have a choice um i'm signed up to friends of the earth and greenpeace who highlight important petitions for me which i sign and share out but i'd like to know more about how i can influence policy better and impact more yeah and that's important i mean i do all of the this stuff you had i don't want you to think that i i sort of don't recognize and respect the work being done by mainstream environmental organizations i really do and and for me this is a multicolored tapestry of tactical approaches to this and and i'd never i i would never actually sit there and say this is the only way to do it we have to do it in whatever way we can and make it work as well as we can so the actual business of influencing policy can only be done by working with the politicians at the local level as well as at the national level. And I do think that the local level is where a lot of change is gonna come. So mm. again, you, you said it, let's not bang on too much about Bristol, but you've got a chance in Bristol to make stuff happen, which would make many other cities around the UK sit up and say, whoa, okay, that's what dealing with a climate emergency looks like. That's what getting on top of our ecological emergency looks like. That's what doing it intersectionally, doing it so that you respect the issues of social justice and racial inequality. That's what that looks like. I just want there to be lobbying for policy change to be connected with real change in people's lives. That's the thing that, that for me will make the biggest yeah. difference. Yeah at work we talk a lot about um live policy right. and how you can you know make can take it out off the paper and, and make it feel like it responds directly to what's going on so I, I definitely i definitely hear that um we um we have a couple more questions although i'm not sure on what there's a question here and maybe jonathan you'll know what this is it says jonathan what are your thoughts towards sdgs Good. You know what SDGs are? Yes, yes, the Sustainable Development okay. Goals. Good that they exist. Uh, yep, I, 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 yep. yep, they're good. Yeah. <laughs> also, do you think that they can drive drive radical transformation or just another triple bottom line reporting system without, without much They change? can't drive radical transformation because they were put together by governments of the world and governments of the world are not yet reconciled to the need for radical change. But they're very useful and they're important. They help a lot of people see the connections between all of these different issues brilliant so um before we end jonathan we we spoke about um doing something which you might find a bit silly but um we like to keep things fun so in our own version of snog marry or avoid <laughs> um and inspired by this themes this year's um festival theme reset rebuild and reimagine what do you think is one thing we need to collectively reset one thing you think we need to rebuild and one thing you think we need to reject in order to avoid runaway climate change okay so the if my um reset is the is the snog version as it were yeah i'm snog. sticking with my local story here i love what's happening locally 
I've been looking at tons of new local initiatives, community municipal investments. There's tons of stuff going on, Uella, and I'm really, really keen on that. In terms of the Mary bit, I want the natural nature, the national nature service to come alive as a huge potential game changer in the lives of millions of people in this country, particularly young people. And um, avoid, so that's reject or whatever it is. is um, I, I just want there to be honesty in political positioning. I can't bear the hypocrisy of politicians claiming to be speaking in the name of a major reset for a better world, when in reality, all they're doing is propping up the old world. I just can't be doing with that any longer. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Jonathan. Um, we're going to, um, on that note, we're going to end there. But um, on behalf of Communicate, we'd like to thank you so much for uh, such an insightful, fun and a hopeful conversation. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, Yola. Bye, everyone.